Thank you all uh, so much for coming. I'd like to welcome you to our panel discussion, a conversation about, uh, about the ethics of climate change research. Naomi Oreskes is a professor of history and science studies at the University of California, San Diego, and an adjunct professor of geosciences at the Scripps Institution of Oce Oceanography. Noah Diffenbaum, um, he is an assistant professor in the School of Earth Sciences and the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford. Should scientists engage in policy advocacy? Climate change is an issue with a large moral dimension, and there's no real getting around that. I am not comfortable um, being engaged in policy advocacy. Uh, I am, um, and that being said, much of my group's work is very policy relevant. Next question is what role do values play in the research more generally? I think it's important that we as scientists are clear about um, where, our, you know, where our statements are evidence-based. Um, and at the least, that we're clear about what statements are evidence-based and what, what statements are value judgment. If scientists hadn't thought that this wasn't a problem about which something might need to be done. They would have not felt the need to create the IPCC. They would have simply published their articles in peer-reviewed journals as they would do any science. The whole reason why an assessment process gets created for ozone or acid rain or climate change or vaccines, you know, I mean, one of the earliest Royal Commissions in the history of science was the Royal Commission on the Efficacy of the Smallpox Vaccine. Right? Why, are these cre why are these special commissions and assessments created? It's because the science has policy implications. No, you, you edit uh, a journal. Um, and I guess the question to you is, um, how do you decide what should go in the journal? Fundamentally, we, we want science to be correct. And we want it to be reproducible. We want it to be um, uh, clear. And, and um, those are, th that's, that's absolutely necessary. From a social point of view, from a policy standpoint, from the question of why the community at large should accept the results published in NOAA's journal, the answer is it has nothing to do with whether or not the people submitting to NOAA's journal are objective or neutral or not value-laden or smart or dumb. It has to do with whether or not his journal is doing a good job of peer review. And if the peer review process is working as it should, and not just in his journal, but of course in all the different journals, then we have some reason to believe that the net result is going to be reliable, irrespective of what values people may bring to the table initially. If the motivation of a large group of people was not to get the science right, but was instead to have a, some policy outcome, then I think that that would, would uh, risk failure of the, of the scientific review process. And so um, for me individually, I guess it's, um, to the extent that I'm willing to cop to having an ideology about, about all of this, it's, to, it's, it's that the science be as value-free as possible, as objective as possible, as skeptical as possible, as uh, evidence-based as possible. Um, because I think that we, we need that, that confidence, uh, both from the individual, for the individual work and for the, for the peer review process. I'd like to ask, how should we um, try to guard against the potential distorting effects of various funding sources and the kind of uh, incentives that come along with that. And I'll turn to Noah first. I think I should be wearing the logos of the National Science yeah, Foundation yeah. and the Department of Energy. And no, no, I agree questions. with that, but I think you might want to clarify what you mean by solved, because I, I think for the general public it might not be clear to them what, that what you mean when you say it's solved. I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that there are no outstanding uh, scientific questions uh, about climate, and I, don't, I actually don't... Uh, oh. Well, thanks for coming. But I think the most compelling example is bicycle helmets. So I've asked people, there's not a single student here that doesn't realize that bicycle helmets are dangerous. They're not addicted to not wearing bicycle helmets. They don't, uh, they're, you know, they're not delicious. You know, so, so there's a whole list of reasons why behavior doesn't, you know, knowledge doesn't equal behavior. Well, I just want to say one thing. I told my daughter yesterday that if she doesn't wear her bicycle helmet, I'm going to stop paying her Stanford tuition. So, <laughs> so sometimes you have leverage, you know. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, uh, so I'm trying to think of what the climate change equivalent is. Well, I, I don't, I mean, I, to me it is, it, and anyone can feel free to, to disagree with me, and even to voice it. Um, but, I mean, it, there are completely separate issues. The issue of whether or not climate change is occurring, and whether or not further emissions of greenhouse gases will cause further climate change to occur is a separate question from 
whether anything should be done, what anything should be done. I did not at all intend to say, and if I did say it, I misspoke or didn't speak clearly, I did not at all intend to imply that all research is always fine and acceptable under all circumstances as long as it's open, as long as we can publish results. That's not what I meant. I absolutely agree with Steve Gardner and many other moral philosophers that there could be many reasons why either you as an individual or an institution might decide not to pursue certain forms of research. And with that, I, I wanted to thank you all for coming and especially thank our, our two panelists, uh, Noah Diffenbaugh. <laughs> and, and uh, Naomi Oreski, 